Well, happy Pentecost, everybody. Good to see everyone here. Hope you all had a nice rest on the Sabbath yesterday. I know we did. We had, um, so it was like a double. It was like a double Sabbath for us. So, you know, there's not a lot of things you could do anyway, aside from that, which is a good thing sometimes, you know. So, <clears throat> now, this day that we're keeping today, this day Pentecost, Pentecost, it's a day that our Father in Heaven, Yah, He made that holy. Um, it's called Pentecost, all right, in the Greek, which I believe means count 50. Uh, it's also called the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of the Harvest or simply just first fruits. Now the feast, it's called the first, the feast of the first fruits of the wheat harvest in Exodus 4, 22. I'm not going to turn there. But in scripture, there's actually five first fruits, at least that I've been able to see, that are mentioned. And there's two in the Old Testament and there's three in uh, the, what it's been called the New Testament. I like to call them the early word and the latter word of God as opposed to Old and New Testament. But in any event, the first reference that uh, I want to refer to is the Holy Day itself. And this is called First Fruits, and it's what we're keeping today. And the feast is mentioned as the First Fruits in Numbers 28, 26 to 31. And again, I'm not going to turn there, but in your own leisure. A lot of these scriptures, I may not turn to them, but you can... Turn to me your leisure, and some of them are long, so I'm just going to skip through them. I'm not going to read every uh, uh, verse in the scriptures. So, but besides the holy day, there's also a second reference, which is to Israel. Because Israel is a type of first fruit for their Yah's firstborn nation. And you can find that in Jeremiah 2, verse 3. It says, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. And the third reference is obviously Yeshua himself, all right, our Savior. He is the first fruit of all first fruits. According to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he's the first fruit of the resurrection, for he was the first fruit of the wave sheaf offering during unleavened bread, somewhere around 30 AD, depending on who you believe, what they're dating. The best we can tell, he was resurrected at about the same time that the wave sheaf barley was cut that Saturday evening at sunset. And most likely, he was received before the Father at the same time that the wave sheaf was offered in the temple on Sunday morning in that particular year. So this day is what started the count to Pentecost, which led directly to the fourth reference of the first fruits, which is the church itself. The church is a type of first fruit, for it's the first group of people to receive the spirit of Yah. Now, beginning with the church in Jerusalem on Pentecost, but then um, to go spread out everywhere beyond that. And this, when the church had received this uh, gift at Pentecost of the first fruits, that was 50 days after Christ, the first fruits of the resurrection, was the wave sheaf. All right, so, and we could see this. A little bit of, of this as the church, as the uh, first fruits reflected in Romans 8, 22. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And then James also touches on this idea of the church as a type of first fruit. James 1, verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So, if we in the church are first fruits, well, I guess that sort of implies that 
there's a second fruits, right? No, maybe, or maybe a third fruits. I don't know that I don't know, but there is one other group of first fruits and you find that this is the fifth group that I spoke about this is the, the first fruits that are the 144,000 of revelation. They appear and it's hard to say they appear to be and Jim mentioned a little bit about them the first fruits that are alive at Christ's coming. So I guess they're sort of like the I don't know the first fruits of the first fruits. Who knows I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I'm not really going to get into the whole thing about who they are, but just to note that they are specifically mentioned as first fruits. And we can see that in Revelation 14, uh, 1 to 4. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So we see in these verses and in this holy day that there seems to be great significance that Yah places regarding harvests in general. And first fruits in particular, especially associated with these holy days that we keep. So we in Yah's church, we do keep holy days like Pentecost because of our desire to be obedient to our Creator's word. Charles mentioned a little bit about that before. That's how we show, how, like he said, what can we do? What can we do for him except for obey him? That's the simplest thing we could do to show our gratitude and our respect to him. So, and we do this, obviously, to honor our Father and the one who became our Savior, Yeshua, our Messiah. So we in the church, we're aware that these days were planned, right? They were planned, they were designed, they were coordinated, if you will, and appointed not at Mount Sinai, but in the beginning at creation, on the fourth day of creation prior to Mount Sinai. And we know this from Genesis 1, 14. And God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day and the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So these lights, the sun and the moon and the stars were ordained at creation to be signs in the heaven but also for seasons, days, and years. They are heavenly bodies that regulate Yah's calendar system. Now included in that calendar system are these seasons. But what are seasons in the first place? Well, many of us already know that the word seasons does not mean winter, spring, summer, and fall. And we know that by looking through Strong's, the Strong's and coordinates, the Hebrew word translated seasons is moed, okay? And that's in Strong's number OT 4150. I'm not going to read the whole definitions, but I'm going to pick out certain definitions that it gives for this word moed, which is translated seasons. And it's properly an appointment, specifically a festival, by implication an assembly as convened for a definite purpose. And deeper than that is the root word where this word comes from, and that's from Strong's OT 3259. And again, I'll read some of the definitions of that root word where it comes from. To fix upon by agreement or appointment, by implication to meet at a stated time, to engage as in, for instance, marriage, to agree, to make an appointment, to meet together a set time. So basically, seasons or moads means basically holy days as set apart times, times made holy by Yah and set aside to meet with our Elohim. They are set times for assembly, appointments 
on the calendar, if you will, appointments to meet our Creator. And they are witnesses, witnesses shown in the lights of the sky that appear at set times throughout the year. And they are established at creation, not at Mount Sinai. Now these set times, they were given to Israel at Mount Sinai and included in his covenant with them, but they preceded Mount Sinai. So these holy days, first fruits, or at least this holy day, first fruits, AKA Pentecost, as established at creation, all right, along with the others, is a set time, an appointment on our Creator's calendar. Like all the holy days, they were given much later to Yah's people, Israel, as an example, after he had brought them out from Egypt as his own people. They were given to them through ordinances, commandments, and statutes and scriptures such as Leviticus 23, 15 to 21, and, and many others, which I'm not going to go into. So like the weekly Sabbath, these appointed or these holy appointments between Elohim and his creation were not made for Israel, but for mankind at creation. And you could reference this fact in Mark 2, 27 to 28, where Yeshua confirms that the Sabbath was made for mankind, not for Israel. And in Zechariah 14, 16 to 19, that confirms that the holy days, far from being done away, will be kept by all nations once Christ returns. So by his grace, we, brethren, are ahead of the curve, right? We're already on it. By his grace, though, he reveals that to us. So the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, tells us that the early church received the Holy Spirit of God on this holy day that we celebrate. Same holiday that the Apostle Paul continued to observe for many years after Yeshua's ascension from the Mount of Olives into heaven. He tells us so in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 8, and various other scriptures. So it's also interesting to note about this day that in Jewish tradition, the Ten Commandments were said to be given to Israel on this very holy day that we keep today. In the wilderness at Mount Sinai, Israel was given the laws of God. But now, but now in Christ, that same law, that same law is also part of our new covenant, the new covenant, which is written in our hearts. No longer on tablets of stone, but for those who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit from our Father, that was endowed at this time of Pentecost in 30 AD. These laws, these commandments are now written in our hearts as promised in Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 33. So far from being done away, the law is now written again, not on stone, but in our inward most parts, not hidden away in the Ark of the Covenant, but in our flesh of our hearts at the center of our being. Therefore, we keep the law not to earn a salvation, but to keep his laws that he desires us to follow, to follow his way, to respect him, to show our love to him through our obedience, and to be thankful for what he has done for us by giving us life for a life, that most precious life the, uh, through the blood of our Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. So when we gather on this annual appointment, when we gather to remember what God has done for us, giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and looking to what he will do by pouring out his Spirit freely, freely on all those who repent and accept him, and the sacrifice of his only begotten Son, we should keep the theme of the harvest in mind. And all the feast days, 
for they pretty much all have a lot to do with harvesting, as we saw earlier, and we're going to see a little bit more going forward. Because this theme of harvesting is replete throughout Scripture, in Scripture we see lots of references to planting, harvesting, reaping, winnowing, all right? So now this entire concept of harvesting has never been lost in the words of our Savior, Yeshua. And we can see that reflected in Mark 13, 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And then the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather. Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And in Matthew 9, 37 and 38, then said he to the disciples, The harvest truly is plentous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So after his resurrection, and just before his ascension on Mount, Mount of Olives, he prepared the apostles for their mission once he was gone for the planting and the harvesting that would be going on. And he gave them the promise of a specific help in that task. In Luke 24, starting in 45, we see, Then he opened their understanding, that they may understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So on that day of Pentecost, a.k.a. first fruits of the harvest, he would be sending help, a helper, in the form of the Holy Spirit. Now, this would give them the power that they needed to tend to the planting and also to the harvest. First in Jerusalem, then to spread out, to plant and reap all over the world. He gave them the Spirit for a purpose, to do the work of spreading the gospel, the good news, to bring all people to Yah through repentance and for the forgiveness of their sin. It is God, Yah, who does the calling, but he uses people to do the labor for bringing those who are called into his fold. Do we really appreciate that opportunity that he presents us? Think about it. Like, Charles had mentioned that we're nothing. We're nothing at all. But he's actually given us an opportunity to participate in his great work, his great work. He allows us that opportunity to play a part in his plan of salvation for all mankind. So, John 4, 35 to 38. Say not thee, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, ready to harvest. And he say, and he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathers fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And wherein is that saying true? One soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that where ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labor. So he's telling us that that is part of our work. We have labor to do, and he gave that commission to his disciples. So at this point, let's take a look back at that day, back around 30 A.D., <clears throat> when that promise that 
Christ spoke of did come, and his disciples did receive power to begin their labor, the planting and the harvesting that Christ had spoken of. Let's look at one of the laborers who did take that opportunity, and he took it wholeheartedly. On that day, the apostle Peter stood up in front of a crowd in Jerusalem, immediately after having received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in the spirit, the power of that spirit, he gave the first public address and witness to that first fruits of the power that is given to men. And we can find that account in the book of Acts. Acts 2, 1 to 47. I am not going to read the whole thing, but I will be skipping through it. When on the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one cord in one place. And suddenly there came the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now the scripture goes on in Acts and it names all those various nations and all those people who had gone up to Jerusalem for the feast. So skipping down, 11, we heard them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God, these men said. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? But others Others mocking said they are full of new wine. So note what happened. Note what happened as soon as Peter began to use that spirit that God gave within him. Immediately some attacked. They mocked. They belittled. But note how Peter reacted to it. He dealt with the attack by lifting up his voice and proclaiming the truth. Verse 14, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And in and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. So note, one of the first things that is mentioned about receiving the Holy Spirit is prophesying. That word prophesying is basically speaking the word of Yah publicly, inspired speech. And every time we're speaking the word of Yah, we are speaking inspired speech because that's where these words came from. So he was given a gift to do something. So whenever we go out, and we speak the word of God, when we speak about our Messiah, when we speak about the kingdom of God, we are, in that sense, prophesying. We are planting seeds. We're planting seeds for a harvest. So yes, the very first thing that they did was open up their mouth. They communicated the message of the good news boldly. And they reaped a harvest that day. Yes, they did. 3,000 believers in one day, in one day. In Matthew 24, Yeshua said in what has been called the Great Commission, in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So spreading the good news is among the chief purposes of receiving the Holy Spirit. And it should remain that one of the chief reasons today. We have something to do with the gift that we are given. Also, I just want to make a note about Peter's reference to the prophet Joel. Specifically, he quoted Joel 2, 28 to 32. And I, I just want, I want to come back to that 
in a little bit. But just for, ne- for now, I just want to continue a little bit more in Acts, where Peter goes on to tell them, the crowd that was gathered, who Yeshua was and how David, all right, witnessed about him. And he sums up in verses 36 to 47. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord your God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his words were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Again, 3,000 people in one, less than a day, you know, sounds to me like a few minutes almost, or a couple hours at the most. So note, as I mentioned earlier, it's God who does the calling, and we all know that, but he does use people to do the labor of bringing in those called, and that is a real golden opportunity for us, for us nobodies who would be worth nothing otherwise. He gives us a real purpose in our life. So skipping down to verse 47, he says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And um, so, like I said, he allows us, the apostles, and all his humble servants to play a part in what he's doing because he shares everything that he has. He shares everything. He shares life with us. He shares his kingdom with us. And he shares his work with us. So we all know, we all know that the book of Acts is called the book of Acts because they did things. They took action. They took action. They weren't just actors. They weren't acting apart. They took it seriously. They were people of action. And we should be people of action too. Now the true first fruit, Christ, knew that the tendency for people is to sit on what they are given. So he warned the apostles beforehand, ahead of time. One of those ways was in the parable of the pounds, or the minas as it's called in the New King James. And you can find that parable in Luke 19, 11 to 27. Again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to skip through it, starting at 13. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, do business till I come. In other words, act. Get off your butt. Do something while I'm gone. 15. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom... He then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to uh, be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Gained by trading. In other words, the way I see that, putting what was given to you into action, into use. And he does receive an increase from those servants, from each one of them, but skipping down to verse 20, Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collected what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. And he said unto him, out of your own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? He said unto those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten. But they said unto him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you 
that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So the laborers, the laborers, the laborers of the harvest that acted got rewarded. The one that played it safe lost everything. He lost it all. So you can see that our Savior didn't have a lot of good things to say about a servant who was given the mina but was idle with it. So we should ask ourselves, are we using our figurative minas to bring an increase to him when he returns? Now Yeshua also reminded them that it would be difficult, it would be uncomfortable to go against the grain of this world and that there would be obstructions for us. And he tells us that in John 15, 18 to 21, in the world, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, remember the, world, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word, they will keep your word also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Likewise, John 16, 1 to 4. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. So he's giving us them advice they will put you out of the synagogues yes the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service and these things they will do to you because they have, don't know not know the father nor me but these things I have told you that when the time comes you may remember what I told you of them and again, Matthew 5, starting in 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for, for in theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my namesake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So like the prophets, our job is not to remain hidden, not to sit and be comfortable saying that, well, we have all these things, we have the truth, I really have everything I need, so let's just sit here and wait till our Savior comes. Now, a lot of people say, well, where are all the prophets nowadays? Well, he really doesn't need the prophets anymore. The prophets did their work. It's all in the word of God. We are the laborers who go out in the field. We're bringing that out to the world. All the, it's all written down already. All we have to do is share it. That's our job, to just share what was already there. So now, like I was saying, it's very tempting to sit back and do nothing because once you get out there with God's word, you know, you're going to be marginalized. You're going to be ostracized. It's going to happen. It's not an if, it, it, it will. But remember, and that's why he tells us these things because they did it to him first. So don't be surprised when these ha things, don't be discouraged. Don't let them get you down. All right, so we who live in this country, in these United States, we have really the best of the situation of all the brethren around the world, okay? We have many open doors to us. We live in the freest society in the world, at least for the time being, which gives us the opportunity to advance the knowledge of the kingdom of God through our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion, which we currently enjoy, hopefully for a little bit longer time, but Yeshua gives us some sound advice 
in addition to what he already told us in John 9, 4, he said what he does, and we should follow his example, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. So there will be a time when there's going to be no work going on, all right? And there's going to be a time to hunker down. But that time is not yet. The time's not yet. So as I begin to wrap up here, let me go back to something that I mentioned a little earlier, earlier when we saw Peter on Pentecost, uh, where he spoke of Joel. Now, the question that comes up a lot of times is, well, why Joel? Why Joel? Well, let's pick up Acts in uh, 2, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's interesting to me, and I know to many other people, that he would quote Joel at this time. To tell you the truth, it's one of the last... Uh, um, people in the Bible, I would expect them to be quoting at a time like that. And over the years, I'm not the only one, many people have, you know, commented on this connection, you know, um, because, you know, those things, a lot of those things don't seem to have transpired at that time. And it appears almost a bit out of context for the time period that he was in. But I sort of look at it in in this way, and if you have a different way of looking at it, that's fine, it's, it's no problem. There's different ways of parsing these time periods and these things that I'm going to go over. But I see may, uh, four main time periods in Yah's plan. And I'll call the first one the pre-Messianic time period. The second I'll call the Messianic visitation time period. The third I'll call the end time period. And the fourth I'll call the day of the Lord period of time. So it's this third end time period that I think is what Peter was referring to when he spoke of Joel. So let me explain what I, what I mean by that. The way I see God's holy days, his plan of salvation, is that these holy days are spread out over a seven-month period, beginning at Passover in the spring and ending with the last day, that great day, in the fall, covering a period from the first month on God's calendar to the seventh month. Also note that there's about a four-month gap in between the spring holy days and the fall holy days, right? In that first period, that pre-Messianic period, I see that as where we saw the establishment of the holy days, as we talked about before, you know, at creation. And this period from creation all the way up to Yeshua's time on the earth, and that time foreshadowed the holy days as a time where the holy days were practiced by Israel as a type of rehearsal, if you will, for the true events that would come in the next period when Yeshua came. Sort of like planting the seeds of the harvest almost. Which brings us to the second period, the time of the period of the messianic visitation where Christ would fulfill the first spring holy days from Passover through unleavened bread during the wave sheaf and up to Pentecost. That fulfilling is what we in the church commemorate each year. No longer are we doing the rehearsal as Israel did. We're actually commemorating 
events of the awesome things that were done by our Savior for us. So these we commemorate throughout the next period that we go into and beyond. It's a type of the first fruit of the harvest as Pentecost pictures. A reaping from the seeds that were sown during that first pre-Messianic period. Which leads us to this next third period, the end time period. This is the period that I believe that Peter was referring to when he quoted Joel. This is that long period figuratively pictured by that four month gap between Pentecost and Trumpets. This period, as Peter states, began on 30, right around 30 AD, but would continue till the day of the Lord came, right? Because he says these things all happen before the day of the Lord, all right, he comes. So those things in Joel, some have already happened, at least in part like the giving of the Spirit to the first fruit of the church and the beginning of the prophesying of the church. But many other things would come later because this is a big time period. It's a long stretch. And like the things like the, um, the signs in the heavens, the fire and the blood, the sun and the moon darken, all this before the day of the Lord. A little bit at a time, these things have been unfolding during this figurative four month gap between the spring holy days and the fall holy days. So during this period, the church is laboring in the field, planting seeds, harvesting other first fruits, and preparing for the great harvest at the end. Now remember that four month gap that we mentioned between Pentecost and Trumpets. I want you to take note of John 4. Okay, we read it previously, let's, let's note it again. John 4, 35 to 38. But I'll just read uh, 35 right now. Say, ye not, uh, say not ye, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, ready to harvest. In these words, don't, I think he's saying, and what, sort of what uh, I think uh, Peter was reiterating, is don't wait until the Lord's day. The time to labor is now, all right? The time is now, leading up to that end time, that period, that four-month period between Pentecost and Trumpets. Now, this end time period culminates in what I see as the fourth period, the day of the Lord period. Now, Jim in his talk touched a little bit on that. So this, I see this day of the Lord period as encompassing all the unfulfilled fall holy days. This, I mean, all these will be fulfilled when Christ returns. And that is the day of the Lord, which I see as stretching from right before trumpets, as Peter and Joel uh, talk about through atonement and through the feast of the in gatherings of the harvest or tabernacles and right through what we call the last great day. Now these days of the last of the great last harvest, these are the final reaping and the winnowing, the winnowing that's associated with reaping takes place. The winnowing is the separation of the wheat and the chaff after the harvest. So I just see that as a explanation for why Peter chose Joel to bring out at that time of Pentecost. So for us, brethren, each year, every year, when we honor and observe the full holy days, we are keeping a type of rehearsal, looking forward to those full holy days when they're fulfilled. Upon Christ's return, they will be fulfilled in real time. I believe just like the spring holy days were fulfilled in real time. And after that, they will be kept not as a rehearsal anymore, but as a commemoration for all the awesome things that our Elohim has done for us. And 
not only us, but all mankind and all nations from that time forward. Praise God, brethren. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.